high voltage transmission lines can be split into several categories. I'm talking about high voltage lines here, not these. These are medium voltage. And if they're bundled together, they're probably low voltage. Back to the topic, high voltage. Let's use America, for example, because they're like my main demographic. Well, it is what it is, all here capitalism. Actually, let me know in the comment section where you guys are watching this from and what uniqueness do you have there. I would love to know actually. Long transmission interconnection lines in America. They connect various smaller systems in the USA and Canada, the East, the West, and Texas. Why you know interconnection Texas? It takes the meaning of live free or die to a whole new level. The first category of high voltage transmission lines are these ones. Their purpose is to transfer power. Then we have the other category, and their purpose is to transfer power. Yes, yes, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, I'm getting to it. The shorter lines are transferring power to get closer to the end users. The high voltage transmission lines within a system typically have their power flow in one direction. Let me add it back to the earlier description. The purpose of these transmission lines is to transfer power from the source to the consumer. Yes, 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 I know I'm going to get in the comments. Short transmission lines also transfer power in bidirectional. What do you mean? Well, okay, that is true. Over time, the network will experience changes and power flow is something that goes from source to sink. If the location of the power plant, aka the source, changes, and or if the location of the consumer changes, grows, expands or shrinks, or evolves over time, the power flow will experience changes. What I'm trying to say is that when the plan is designed for this line, it was with the purpose and intention of electric juices from here, bring there, and end of story. Now, if the sun shines, the power flow is this way. If the wind blows, the power flow goes that way. And if there's a full moon, the power stays stagnant and doesn't flow at all. It's a fucking tough job being a planner these days. The previous generation is like giving a shit. I, I could afford a house, food, and student loan with my pay. And then disregard the challenges that this generation face. Okay, too much rambling. Moving on to the long lines. The long interconnection lines are transferring power between regions and systems. They are designed to change the direction much more frequently. Twice a day, five times a day, ten times a day. Whatever floats your boat. Maybe sometimes some people have it zero times a day. Like, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to judge. It's a matter between two parties and it should stay between those two parties. Close the door, discuss, do what you want. <clears throat> of course, I'm talking about transmission lines here. Not sure what you people are thinking. When there is a frequent directional change, some stuff need to be have more consideration. Things like protection. <laughs> this is a transmission line and power system video, goddammit. Other than protection to consider, which is very important by the way, for both the topics, there's also an issue on oscillation, and there is more apparent when there is interconnection involved. I will get back to the system oscillation part later in this video. Some systems just straight up use HVDC for interconnection. HVDC is high voltage direct current. HVDC is expensive, but if the distance is long enough, then there is enough efficiency there to justify it. Well, some may ask, what other efficiency you're talking about? Transmitting power over long distance is tough for AC connection compared to DC because, like, okay, here, here are the 10 marks for your question and answer. Because DC doesn't need to transfer any reactive power. There is no reactive power in DC connection. In the super long lines, AC lines will be highly influenced with reactive power. The VAR can be hard to control and it also eat up transmission line capacity that is meant for transferring real power instead. Whereas DC connection provides you ultimate control. You can set how much power to send down to the exact decimal. None of the nonsense of power oscillation problems. There are several ways to mitigate the effect of uncontrollable VAR. VAR is like this annoying thing that keeps making your life hard. So, how do we control it? Well, we need to send them down to eat some dirt. Yes, that is the best solution for the referees in the Premier League and also the VAR reactive power in AC transmission lines. We are having a lot of dual topics today. Why do we send them down? And how do we send them down? On the Y part, 
transmission lines behave differently based on their positions and their neighbors. They will have inductive influences on this and this, and then capacitive influence on this and the ground. Everyone will be influenced by VAR and have their performance affected. So we get to the how part. We can use a transposition tower. The transposition tower will rearrange your g we rearrange the position of the transmission lines so they will get new positions and new things beside them. You will usually transpose the lines two times across the overall distance, two times so that they are three sections. Each section would roughly be the same distance and each phase would get a chance to be on top and also the bottom. The Seme and Uke experience. By transposing, the overall capacitance for the whole line is approximately balanced. Getting back to the oscillation part mentioned earlier in the video. Oscillation is caused by the natural govern reaction or even the AGC, Automatic Governor Control, which is the centralized system that coordinates the group generators in the area. This is the system that 99% of the world uses. The 1% is where GE, Siemens and Schneider have not been able to get to yet. System oscillation. It is a huge topic, but I'll try to keep it simple. It happens when two or more systems try to balance their own systems connected by the interconnection. Before the comment section erupts, I know, I know it can happen without interconnections, but we are talking about long line interconnections in this video. System operators are monitoring and controlling their own network. They do not have much coordination with their neighboring network. Other than, yo, you stay stable, I stay stable, and we're gonna be okay. Yeah, we're gonna be okay. Power systems are constantly changing. Consumers are using more electricity or less electricity every single second. The operators need to balance out their system frequency and keep their system stable. This can actually cause load hunting, a small imbalance occurrence in one system that can leave the system in a small deficit. Your neighbor sends over some electric juices to assist you. Your own system will generate some more compensation for the deficit too. Now your system is in surplus. The extra power is sent back to your neighbor. Your neighbor reduces their generation to accommodate the surplus you sent over. Your generators also tune down to reduce the over frequency. Now you're in deficit again. Your neighbor system helps out, sending power over and the whole process repeats. So you're sending power back and forth each other, and that is oscillation. Most of the well-designed systems will actually damp out these oscillations and make it not dangerous. The early example I gave is how oscillation can start and sustain. The geography part. If there's a hill along the path of the line, they will plant the transmission tower on top of that hill. And then the management team would be like, make sure like no lightning strikes on the lines. I don't want any trippings. Like what you expect, man? Come on. You put the structure of a highly conductive material to the place that is closer to the clouds, shorter path for the lightning to travel. And then you tell your planning team that if lightning strikes on this tower and cause tripping, then it's a bad design and bad planning. Like why are towers on top of mountains anyway? Well, the real reason is that it is the easier place to allocate land. No other people would want to conflict with it. It could be some other reasons too. I'm curious to know why we actually commit such huge resources to build towers at hard to access places and then commit more resources to get to these hard to access area for maintenance. Like if heavy duty off-road vehicle can't get there, they would use helicopters. They will fly in the equipment needed and the people to operate them and the concrete for the foundation for the tower, and then the mass also. It is indeed expensive to do this for every mass on the line, but apparently over the span of decades, the cost is well worth the effort, which is kind of insane. This is something that I'm actually curious. If you do have a reason on why we build towers in very re remote location areas like top of the hill, please do let me know. You're watching the Funsi channel. Do, 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 do.